Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be in here, but it, uh, I, I figured the 8.30 service would be a little bit lighter. I was hoping we'd have more people than this, but we all have some learning to do on what we're comfortable with in this new normal. Uh, I'm just really excited that we're here this morning to be able to praise and, and lift our Father up. So the focus of this morning, just so you're aware, Jim's going to be speaking on the Holy Spirit. He's been sort of building up on that. If you've been watching the worship services and his lessons over the last few weeks, he kept saying, we're going to do this in about three weeks, and then in about two weeks, so he's been on a countdown. So we're there, finally. We've got uh, limited songs. We're going to sing four songs, and then one will be played during the Lord's Supper, but the, the PowerPoint's going to be up here. We've got a couple songs that you may not be familiar with. So during the Lord's Supper, we have an a cappella version of that song that's going to be playing, and you can sing along with the PowerPoint if you don't know it. Uh, but we do need to try to stay on task. Obviously, we have another worship service coming up at 10. So there's going to be a little bit of a transition. Uh, hopefully the timing of this is well done, and we can be done uh, about 9.30 and be able to, to have you leave as we transition out the caution tape and all those kind of things. So... Uh, you know, please provide some feedback to the office, to the elders about how the service is going, what you think needs to be done, uh, any suggestions, because we're all just trying to learn what the new is right now. So uh, let's praise our, our Lord and Savior. We're going to sing, Oh, to be like thee. Let's go ahead and stand up, if you would. <laughs> oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant. Church. Uh, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say for this morning. Uh, I thought about maybe I should talk about, you know, if my relationship with the welcome has changed in the past five months. It hasn't. Uh, maybe I should talk about all the lessons we've learned in the past five months. Nah. Maybe if I should talk about like, deep reflections over the past five months. Not that either. Uh, honestly, I think the best thing I can say to you is simply welcome and then shut up <laughs> for me to just be quiet for a second. Because after these five months and finally being back in here, uh, I realize this has nothing to do with us and everything to do with God. So it doesn't matter if we were outside or in here, uh, the praise doesn't change. So welcome. And let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning, uh, for waking us up and bringing us together. Uh, God, no matter where that is, now it's in the auditorium again. Uh, Father, I pray that we remember it doesn't matter where we are, uh, but God, as we sing praises to you, I've got to do it with our hearts and sing as loud as we can. I thought to glorify your name, uh, no matter what kind of life we're living. 
if it's a life of fear, Father, if it's a life of, of worry or doubt, if it's moments of pain and panic, uh, God, then all things, we give all these things to you and live a life dedicated to your son. Uh, Father, we thank you for the love you've given us in the Southwest Church of Christ, and I pray that in all things, uh, Father, we glorify your kingdom. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our next song is called Breathe on Me, Breath of God. The Holy Spirit is many, many times referred to as the breath of God. And as Caleb just said, something about sometimes there's time to just be quiet. And I think uh, we really need to feel like the Holy Spirit is that little quiet voice. And if we don't just quiet ourselves and listen to him talk to us, we are getting in the way of God being God. We're getting in the way of the Spirit guiding us when we're talking so loud, just like I'm probably talking too much right now. Breathe on me, breath. Good morning, everybody. Hey. Today's scripture reading is John 16, 5 through 15. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the adv advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he, what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Good morning. I, I'm kind of muffled, so it's kind of weird because... First of all, I'm not sitting over there. Uh, secondly, Caleb is sitting by himself over there. Uh, you want to join me? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. But it is really, really good for us to be together again. And uh, even though it's not uh, ideal, uh, it's, it's what it is. I usually, the first Sunday of the month, do birthdays. Do we have any children who have birthdays in September? We got, we got, come on, and, and, and social distance. Stand up here, okay? I would love to hug on y'all. Oh, we got more, yeah. Come on up. Stop. Right there. Yeah. 
<laughs> Come on over here. Stand, be friends. But, but stop right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like we're taking a wedding picture, you know. She's down there. And, no, we are blessed to have uh, our young people, and uh, we will continue to, to pray over them. Let's pray. Father, you have given us um, so many blessings in life. And one of the blessings that we enjoy are these young people. And for their young lives and for their love of you. And we pray that they will love you all the days of their lives. That they will remember this time not because of me at all. But because of the prayers of all of this church that will go up and ask that you bless them. And that they always remain true to you. Thank you, Father, for each one. Thank you for their families. And we pray, Father, that you will be with them, especially during this time. Uh, thank you for your love and your care. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can go sit down. <laughs> I can tell our kids love to do that. There are certain moments in life that are just moments. They are just what, what, what we said there are. I mean, I, I think of several things that have happened here at, at Southwest. It's, it's like, whoa, that was something, you know. Uh, and, and we have one of these things here in the Gospel of John. Um, they are about to participate, to be a part of, to see the greatest event that ever happened in the history of mankind. They are about to see, uh, and, and this sounds morbid and I don't mean it that way, but the death and the burial and then the excitement of all this, the resurrection of Jesus. And you can imagine the, 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 just the event to be able to be a witness to that. Well, Jesus tells them, I'm so happy to have this back too, by the way. Jesus tells them, and it doesn't work. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we've proven that we can make it without it, haven't we? Jesus tells them, now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. Now, if you think about it a little bit, uh, didn't, didn't one of them, I think it was Thomas, didn't he, or, or maybe Philip, I don't know, uh, earlier in chapter 14 when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and, uh, you know, in my Father's house are many rooms, and, and, you know, we don't know where you're going. I, and and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, didn't he say that? Well, uh, in, in verse 14, or chapter 14, it says, I'm going to prepare a place. It was Thomas who said, we don't know where you're going. Well, two things. Either there's been a long enough period of time between the time Thomas said that and the time Jesus said that, but I have a hard... Uh, a hard time with that simply because it's all right there it's just a matter of hours or number two jesus was talking about him being the way and the truth and the life and the rest is about his death and the gravity of the moment is finally sinking in and they're sitting around and their concern is not about the suffering of Jesus. But their concern is about them and their grief. Now, Jesus tells them he's leaving. He's alluded to, to the Holy Spirit a number of times. But he tells them that it's good that he's leaving. Because he says, if I don't leave the Holy Spirit or the advocate, the NIV uses the word advocate. Other words, uh, other translations use counselor. And Jesus says, if he doesn't come, I mean, if I don't go, he won't come. Now, you sit there and think about that for just a moment. Because Jesus says his physical presence would be replaced 
by something else. Now, here's the thing. Jesus' physical presence, and, and I, boy, I've, I've said this before, and people struggle with this sometimes. Jesus, because he became a man, made himself limited. Yeah, if he had wanted to, he could have been anywhere he wanted. He could have been omnipresent. He could have been all those other things. But he limited, him, limited himself to a physical body, and he couldn't be everywhere at once. At least not in the human flesh. And he says, I've got to go so the advocate can come. So there can be this omnipresence. So that there can be this power within you. Jesus said there are two aspects of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit. Beginning in verse 8 of chapter uh, 15, 16, I'm sorry. He says, starting in verse 8, he says, when he comes, he will prove the, to the world that uh, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of the world now stands condemned. Now, in this passage here, the Holy Spirit will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, the, 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 the God's Word translation says it will convict them. Now, if there's a conviction in a trial, if there's a conviction in a court case, they have said, yes, this is true. Yes, he is convicted. Yes, the, the evidence shows. And so Jesus says here, in essence, he says the world will understand their condition when the Holy Spirit comes. Now, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. You're saying, well, they don't. But, but hang in there for just a minute. I think it's interesting, and I, I thought about this. Paul one time was talking to, to a governor, Felix, and, and, you know, how many opportunities do you get to speak to, a, to an official like that? How many times are you allowed to, to bring this gospel message? And what would you say if you were called before, I don't know, Governor Ricketts? Or, or maybe even Senator Sass? Or, or, or maybe even further on, you know, maybe some kind of other politician? Or some leader, Mayor Stothert, it doesn't matter. What would you say to them if they were to say to you, tell me a little bit about why you are the way you are. Paul says, before Felix and Drusilla, he says he talks, the scripture says he talks about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, that sounds very similar, doesn't it? In, in, in interesting how, how the two are so similar. And I could make a case for what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit and what, what Paul said to Felix and Drusilla are the same. But let's look at each one of those. Jesus says sin. That he will convict the world of sin. Now, what's the definition of sin? Uh, you know, I, if I threw that out, you would probably say, well, sin is, is a violation of God's law. That's the simple version. Somebody else wrote, sin is a condition and activity of human beings that is offensive to God, their creator. But even that seems to be a little bit inadequate. We know that even angels sinned in 2 Peter chapter 2. But we'll not deal with that right now. But Jesus defines what sin is. And, and what's interesting to me is he says these three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment, and then he separates them out. He says about sin, what's he say? About sin because, I've got righteousness, because people do not believe in me. 
say, well, that sounds a little weird, doesn't it? That sounds a little odd. That sounds a little off. But Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so he says, in essence, the Holy Spirit will convict people if, if they don't obey the commands of Jesus. All right, you say, I, but there are still a lot of people out there who aren't convicted, if you want to use that word. Hang in there with me. Righteousness. Righteousness seems to be directly relatable to sin, at least. Now, we've talked about this before. We've talked that righteousness is not rightness. It's not so much being right as it is living right. And I think Pharisees here. The Pharisees were very good at obeying the law, but they, what they did, they, they were so adamant about following the law that they would beat people over the head with it. And Jesus says, you know what? You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And so that's what I think of. But again, Jesus says something interesting. He says about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can no longer see me. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We say it's about righteousness because you're going to the Father. Well, he declared that he and the Father were one, didn't he? And if he's gone, doesn't that remove the need for righteousness? No, it doesn't. But it's interesting to note that the change that happened in people's lives came about as a result of knowing who Jesus was. The centurion at the cross. Surely, this was the Son of God. Those on Pentecost who realized what they had done, they had crucified Jesus, but it was after the fact. Paul would drag people away for persecution, but he changed his life after meeting Jesus. So Jesus has to leave in order to, to die in order for the world to have the verdict reversed not guilty but number three judgment jesus again has an interesting statement he says about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned okay well, who's the prince of this world? Who's Jesus talking about? I think that's obvious. It's Satan, isn't it? We make this gospel stuff awful hard. We make it so difficult that people have a hard time understanding. And it's really very simple, basically. And that is, there is a right and there is a wrong. There is a Jesus and there is a Satan. There is doing what Jesus wants us to do. There is doing what Satan wants us to do. And everything boils down to those two options, to those two choices. Now, I want you to note something. We've all been associated with people who can't give one hoot about sin or righteousness or judgment so how does the Holy Spirit convict the world? It comes through a channel. And that channel is us. That channel is Christians who believe what Jesus said. So if you look at 12 through 15, I have much more to say to you more than you can now hear. Jesus makes an interesting statement. He says, you guys can't handle it right now. I've thrown a whole lot at you. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. 
And that is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. It says the Holy Spirit that he will guide us in all truth. What I think this means is a transformation. A transformation on our part. We act differently. We think differently. We are different because the Holy Spirit lives in us. I don't believe that the Spirit is through the Word only, but I do believe the Spirit will never contradict the Word. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He leads us, and He guides us, and He teaches us to follow God's Word. He transforms us and makes us more and more like Jesus. And when we open our hearts to the Spirit, unbelievable things happen. A change occurs in us. And a change occurs in those of the world who see clearly now for the first time. He truly reveals who Jesus is and who we could be. So one of those things that he does, when he guides us in all truth, he transforms us. He makes us into a different person. Isn't that what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where he says, you are now a new creation. A new creation. There is something that's different about you. David says, create in me a clean heart. In other words, he's saying, make me a different person. And that's what he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He changes us. But he says then, Jesus says, he will glorify Jesus, who in turn glorifies God. Glory in the Greek means to think. And when we understand who Jesus is, we will glorify God. When we understand who Jesus is, we will realize just how much we need him. When we understand who Jesus is, we'll receive his grace and his mercy. To glorify Jesus meant that Jesus will be vindicated in the eyes of the world. And you said, man, again, Jim, what you're saying is nuts. That's not happening. It will. And as the centurion said, surely. He's the Son of God. Now, if you were expecting me to tell you what the Holy Spirit does in terms of, well, he does this and he does this and does this, I encourage you to go to this passage right here in John chapter 16. Because Jesus doesn't say it the way that I wanted him to say it. Jesus Jesus doesn't tell us what the Holy Spirit does the way I think he ought to tell it. But of course, what he says is always right. And if the world is going to see that it is wrong, that it is a follower of Satan, then it's up to us to be the conduits. And then our lives are transformed. Our lives are lived in a constant glorifying of Jesus. Well, I, I don't even know if I'm supposed to do an invitation. <laughs> I don't think I am. We, we didn't do an invitation out, outside. But I, I, I want you to see, I, I, and again, I think we make things so difficult. I think we, we make things so hard, and Jesus breaks it down and makes it so simple. For all of us. So I, I want us to pray. And, and, and ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. To transform us and make us who he wants us to be. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for... For he... 
tells us that he's going to send the comforter, the advocate, the teacher. And he has come. And Father, help us to realize that we are Jesus with skin. That we become transformed and to become like him. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song is basically just a prayer doing exactly what Jim just suggested we do. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Holy Spirit, let me see all the things you are, all the things you want me to be. So that's what we're going to be singing here. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. to look at a wonderful passage from uh, Romans 8. In most Bibles it is given a man-made uh, title, Nothing Can Separate Us from God's Love. And as I read through this passage, I am really overcome by God's love for us and how he holds us in his hand. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his only son, but gave him up for us all. Won he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing 
in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this passage we see three amazing things. No one can really be against us. No one can condemn us. And finally, the greatest of all, no one can separate us from God. Calamity, troubles, strife, angels, demons, fears, worries, COVID-19, unrest in our streets, in our communities, not even the powers of hell, nothing in all creation, absolutely nothing can separate us. We are his and he is ours. We are safely held in his hands. Today, as we take this communion, we remember what Christ has done for us. Let us remember these three wonderful things from Romans 8. No one can be against us. No one can condemn us. And no one can separate us from God's love. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, as we take this bread... We see the body of Christ that hung upon that cross for our sins. And Father, as we take this bread, we pray that we truly see your love through the sacrifice that was given for us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. And likewise, Father, we pray that as we take of this juice, this fruit of the vine, we pray that we truly see the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. And Father, we are so thankful for the gift that is ours through again through our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now let us give thanks for the blessings that surround us and for the generosity of our God. Father, as we have assembled here this morning, we are so aware of your goodness for the blessings that have been showered upon us. And Father, we pray that uh, as we give back, that we would give willingly, that we would give cheerfully for what is ours. A Savior that died for us, for the truth that nothing can separate us from your love. And it's through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ again once we pray. Amen. Spirit
Good morning, church family. <clears throat> it's been quite a while since we've had the opportunity to look at each other face to face. And some of you with your mask on, I still don't know who you are. So I remember a time in our lives when if you walked into a bank with a mask on, you were in trouble. Today, you walk into a bank without a mask on, you're still in trouble. I'd like to say thanks to all of those of you who helped with our morning services. Uh, it was very successful. And uh, for those who got up and got out, and, uh, some enjoyable times and good lessons at that time. Uh, the Mountain States Children's Home, uh, we're accepting donations now. Uh, they will be coming, I think, by October the 18th. And so anything that you would like to contribute to them would be great, gratefully uh, appreciated. There's a list on the A-frame out in the foyer, so you can check that and see what they want. <clears throat> How many of you have an older brother? I had two older brothers, and they're both gone. But one of them, on his passing, and after the kids had gone through several of my brother's articles and so forth, um, and the billfold, I got to go through the billfold and found something that has always touched my life. I'd like to read it to you. It says, a new day. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or use it for good. But what I do today is important because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something that I have traded for it. I want it to be gain and not loss, good and not evil, success and not failure, in order that I shall not regret the price that I have paid for it. <clears throat> Let us pray. <coughs> our Father and our God, thank you so very much for another beautiful day in our lives. We're so blessed. Thank you for watching over our loved ones who are so precious to us. Our church family and our blood family, I don't know what we would do without that, Father, and without that avenue of prayer. The opportunity to be able to visit with you any time, any place, day or night. One of the things that I've always said to our young people, they can't take prayer out of church or out of school because all they have to do is think of you and say a prayer in your name. Father, I pray for those in America who are fighting the virus. Those who have it and don't know it need our prayers. And Father, I pray for the medical personnel that are administering to these people they're putting themselves in harm's way, and I pray that you will protect them and comfort them and give them some rest. I pray also, Father, for those who are doing research, trying to find a vaccine that will help this situation. I pray that you will guide and direct their efforts and that they will be successful and uh, kind of like what a lot of us say, Lord, give me patience right now. And it doesn't work that way, Father. We just need to have patience and leave everything up to you. Pray that you go with us through the remainder of this day and through this week and help us to let your light shine into a world of darkness. Forgive us when we stumble and embarrass you, Father, and don't give up on us. These favors I ask in your Son's name. Amen. Just out of curiosity, how many of the songs that I am leading this morning are familiar to you? How many of you know this song right here that we're about ready to sing? I think that's an indication of how much we do not focus on the Holy Spirit. So another new song, I might be singing a lot of a solo, but a great thing about with a mask is I can't hear you anyway, so it doesn't matter. You're muffled, and if I'm singing by myself, but give it a shot. There's actually three verses and then we'll sing the first verse again at the end on this one so i'm hoping by the time we get done with it that it's a little bit familiar to you holy spirit 
dwell in me. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Touch my eyes that I might see. All your goodness, grace, and power stay beside me every hour. Feed my drink, be my living bread. Keep me shelter, keep me fed. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Holy Spirit, comfort me. time so casual is what we're supposed to be doing uh, fellowship and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing another group of people here pretty soon to enjoy our indoor worship god bless <laughs>